Well, welcome everybody to Organization Boot Camp Challenge Number One Basic Training. And this is a condensed version of our um, Get Organized Challenge, which is normally eight classes. So because it's November, it's um, hard for people to do eight classes, which would run us right through Christmas. So this is for those of you who want to get a good jump on organization. Um, we will do another full series of eight classes in uh, January, and you'll get more information about that. So if you want to sign up and do those classes in January, you're welcome to do those. Well, we'll cover stuff in January that we don't get to um, in this challenge. So let's get started right away. I know there's a lot of you who are new to the webinar sort of concept, so you can't actually see me. You can only hear me and see the screen of my computer, but I'm sitting here in my bunny slippers drinking coffee, and so you can't actually see me. And I apologize for interrupting your um, for interrupting your election night. I, had I realized it was election night, I probably would have changed the dates to Wednesdays or something because I'm a news junkie. So it's as torturous for me as it is for some of you to be. Um, missing the election coverage. Anyway, it'll keep me up late, and it'll keep all of you up late, so we'll know what's happening. So um, now, if you have questions through the session, you, there's a little question pane, a little question box on your navigation pane. Type the questions in as they pop into your head, because you can't actually talk to me, and I don't want you to forget anything. So there's a good chance I'll answer the question as I'm going through the presentation, but I don't want to miss anything. So type it in when you think of it. Maybe I'll answer it. If not, I'll at the very end. Now these are power classes, so there's lots of information condensed down into a single class. What I don't want you to do is get um, overwhelmed and sort of give up on the process. So stick with me, uh, listen through all three of the classes, and some of you will be able to jump right in and get going, and some of you just kind of take it in and kind of figure out how you're going to proceed, and that's perfectly okay. One of the things that makes this um, doing these classes online so successful is that people can move through at a pace that's reasonable for them. The other thing is that many, many of the people who've taken the Get Organized Challenge had an entire room or two rooms full of stuff to organize, and actually getting through 10 or 12 or 15 years worth of stuff in eight weeks is kind of an overwhelming task. So even if you think you have so much stuff that you'll never get organized, Join the Facebook group. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end so you can see what other people have done. And just know that I'm here to help you, and all the ladies who are alumni, graduates of the challenge, are there to help you. And so if you just keep plodding along, you'll do it, and you'll be so glad that you did. Um, okay, so put on your combat boots and your helmet, and let's get started, ladies. So let's talk first about tools. Tools are the physical, tangible things you use to organize your stuff. There are lots of great tools out there. You've probably purchased several of them. But tools are only a small part of the success with organizing. So systems are the big thing that will really make a difference for you. And we're going to talk about those systems tonight, too. We're going to talk a little bit about tools, but we're mostly going to talk about systems. So when we talk about organization, or if you look up the definition for organization, it's going to read something like to put together into an orderly, functional, structured whole. right? And then if you look up system, it says an assemblage of or combination of things or parts forming a complex or unitary whole. And I really want you to focus in on that word whole, because that's what's usually left out when it comes to getting organized. We're usually taught the, the common knowledge is to organize things by type of thing that they are. Buttons in a box, breads in a, you know, in a bin, flowers in a jar, you know, scissors on the wall, whatever. We tend to segment everything. We don't think about it as a whole. Right? Our craft supplies are a whole thing, and we need to put them together in a way that we can think about them as a whole thing instead of thinking about them as individual things. So if you, um, if you think about organizing your stuff, you want to keep things together you would use together. And a great analysis for this is your silverware drawer. So if you think about your silverware drawer, in your silverware drawer, everything you need to set the table is right there in the drawer. So it's really easy to set the table. Knives, forks, spoons, I'm over into the dining room, everything's set, I'm ready to go. Not only is it easy to set the table, after the dishes come through the dishwasher, it's really easy to put those clean pieces of silverware away. It's a simple process of keeping things together you use together. Now, if you took your spoons and you put them in a jar on the windowsill, and you took your forks and you put them in several different baskets around the room, and you put your steak knives in a drawer, but you hung your butter knife decoratively on the wall, 
setting the table would be a pain in the neck, and after everything was washed, putting everything away would be a pain in the neck also. So one of the things that we're really focused on here is this system of keeping things together that we're going to use together. So it's easy to find what you need, and it's equally easy to put things away when you're all done using them, which is another big challenge, right? I'm going to take a sip of coffee. I know you can't see me, so I have to let you know everything that I'm doing. It's kind of like being on the radio. Okay, so when we talk about organization systems, what's the difference between systems and storage, right? So when you establish a system, you're giving your brain a mental path that you can follow to find your stuff, right? When you put things away, you fill a container, buy another container, fill that container, buy another container, fill that container, and it's an endless process of filling containers. That's storage. That's not a system for putting stuff away, right? So you have to rely on your brain for two major pieces of information every time you sit down to do a craft project. The first piece of information is, you know, if you need a red brad, so you have to ask yourself, do I have a red brad? And then if your brain says, yes, you've got a red brad, then you have to ask yourself, your brain, where is that red brad? Well, if your brain says, hey, I know it's in the back room over there somewhere, but I'm sure it'll be faster to run up to the scrapbook store and buy more than it will be to find it, that's where you've got a problem with that brain making a connection to your stuff. So that's really what we're going to talk about today. How do you set up your brain to be able to tell you where your stuff is, and then you can go and find it? So what do you need for tools to get organized? You can use any variety of tools. Boxes, totes, drawers, bins, Ziploc bags, binders, and of course, the scrap rack, which we feel is the best tool out there for you to use. But it's not the only tool, right? And you'll see as we go through the process of these classes, um, if you don't have a scrap rack, you're still going to get so much out of the class. And um, I don't really talk that much about the scrap rack. As a matter of fact, I left off a lot of information in these power classes. Um, so maybe I'll do another little webinar for people who want to learn more. So sorry, I kind of got a little off script there. But you can use anything, that's what I'm saying, to do this. You can apply these um, strategies or these ideas to all kinds of different tools. So some of these tools are going to work better than others. Of course, the scrap rack, we believe, is the best tool. With that said, my bias clearly exposed, the most important thing is the system, the way you will think differently about how to organize your stuff. If I do my job well during this boot camp, you, you'll start to think differently about the way you organize your craft supplies, your linen closet, your bathroom drawers, the glove box in your car. You'll begin to, <laughs> as some of the members of our Facebook group say, tip an eye. And that's really my goal. My goal is to get you to think differently about you, how your stuff is organized, whether it's scrapbook stuff or kitchen stuff or anything else. So important things to know about your organization tools, whatever they're using, whatever you're using. Four important factors. Your stuff needs to be visible. It needs to be accessible. So just because you put your flowers in a jar on a shelf eight feet up around the edge of your room, they're visible in that jar, but the accessibility factor is not good. They're cute, but if you have to go out to the garage and get the step ladder every time you need a blue flower, chances are you're not going to get the flowers. You're going to find something else that's easier to get to, right? So they need to be visible, and they need to be accessible, because easy is key, and easy is key with everything, right? We all know that. The things in our life that are easy to do, we do, and the things that are hard to do end up getting pushed to the back burner. So make it visible, make it accessible. If I could ask you, if I could see all of you out there in, in webinar land, I would say, how many of you love to go to cropping classes? And I'd watch your hands go up. And then I would say, how many of you deplore packing for a cropper class? And I would see most of your hands stay up. And then I would say, how many of you haven't unpacked from the last cropper class that you went to? And many of you would still have your hands up. Because without a portable system, you're constantly having to pack and unpack and organize and reorganize. So part of our goal with this organization tool is that it's visible, accessible, it's portable, and it's expandable. So how many of you think, again, I can't see you, but judging from the fact that I've been teaching organization for 10 years all over the country and asking similar questions, if I said, how many of you think you'll buy one or two more scrapbooking items to add to your collection, I'd see most of your hands go up. So your organization tool needs to be expandable. You don't want to reinvent the way you organize your stuff all the time. You want to have the same system. You just want to expand it out or contract it down depending on what's going on in your life. 
And malleable might actually be a better word there because as our lives change, for instance, if you have little kids, you're scrapbooking about very different things than if you have teenagers or if you have grandchildren or whatever. So that, that component, expandable or changeable or malleable, is important. So what's the system? I'm going on and on. Some of you are just going to just tell me what it is. The system is pretty easy. It's four major categories broken down into a few or maybe a lot of minor categories. So the first section is letters, numbers, and punctuation marks. You can think of this as anything that has to do with writing, tags, titles, journaling, that type of thing. The second section is themes, A to Z. Now many of you are card makers. So card makers, um, it's a little bit easier to think of the themes category as a sentiments category, right? Really similar kinds of things. So if you're a scrapbooker, you might have a baby section. A card maker, you might have a baby section. A uh, card maker is more likely to have a thank you section or a retirement section or a bon voyage, bon voyage section, whereas a scrapbooker might have a travel section, but very similar. So think of that as sentiment. The calendar year, um, obviously January to December, and this is where you're going to incorporate most of your holiday and seasonal materials. And then the final section is the rainbow. And the rainbow is where you put everything grouped by color that wasn't part of the section's uh, first three sections. So let's start with section number one, letters, numbers, and punctuation marks. Tags, titles, and journaling is kind of how I think about this. What belongs in this section? Anything that's alphanumeric but not being specific. I also think that this is a place to corral anything I might use for creating titles or doing journaling. So journaling or lettering templates, products like the Creative Memories, Titletopia, um, those types of things are going to go into this section. So let's look at an example of what that might look like. So um, if you're grouping your alphanumeric supplies together, that makes them easy to find all the letters you need when you're creating a title or journaling. So one of the things that happens in the alphanumeric category is we want to spell something out, uh, a title of some type, right? And so if you store your alphabets, which is what the common thing to do is by color instead of by size, if you're trying to spell out 4th of July and you say, oh, I'm going to write that in red, and then you go to red and you find your, all your red letters, but you don't have enough red letters in the right font to write 4th of July. So you think, oh, I think I might have these in blue too. So then you go to blue and you look there, mm, not quite everything you need. What else could I use? Oh, I might have them in white. So then you go to white and you look for those that same font. So you spent a lot of time and relied on a lot of memory about things you may or may not have purchased. Whereas if you put all your letters together by size, so if you look, there's a couple of good examples on the left side here, similar alphabets, different colors. Now if you want to collage that word together in red, white, and blue, you see the red, the white, the blue, that same font, that same sticker size. So that's why it's important to keep those generic alphabets together by size as long as they're not theme specific. So anything that goes in here, that goes in here is not going to be theme specific. All right. Second section is themes or sentiments A to Z. And these are all the things that you scrapbook or craft about organized from A to Z. If you're a card maker, again, it helps to think of this section as sentiment. This section is going to be different for everybody. Um, themes will change as the things you craft about change. Um, as products change in the marketplace, we get introduced to new things and we think, oh, I could scrap about something I never even thought about scrapping about before because I have this cool new product or whatever it is. So creating a themes or sentiments list will be one of the first steps you take in getting your supplies organized. Sorry, I had to take a drink again. There are some examples of themes lists under the Files tab on our 2011 Get Organized Challenge group on Facebook. So if you're not familiar with the Facebook group, um, if you search for 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group, I know it's not 2011 anymore, but when we started the group, it was. And once you get a certain number of people in the group, you can't change, you can't add to the, you can't change the name. So we have over 3,200 people in the group. We can't change the name. We will forever be the 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group. But the ladies on that group have put together a lot of information, and themes lists are one of the things that you can find in the file section there. So here's some sample ideas for themes or sentiments. Um, and you can see I just highlight, highlighted like our dark pink, the ones that are more sentiments versus theme lists. This will give you a good idea of the different types of things you might consider when putting your themes list together. Now remember, it's going to be different for everybody. And everybody's going to think of things a little bit differently, right? 
So as I travel around the country, when I am in California, everybody has a beach section, right? But when I'm in Oklahoma, beach is something people only do on vacation. So a lot of people there have all their beach stuff under V for vacation instead of B for beach. So this list has to be um, the gut reaction so that you know where to find things, right? My sister puts all of her beach stuff under O for ocean because she's a scuba diver, so that's how she thinks of it. But if I put all my stuff, all my beach stuff under O for ocean, I'd never find it. I'd be forever buying more beach stuff, duplicates of beach stuff, and trying to track it down. So you've got to find it where you think about it. It has to make sense to you. So here's a couple of examples. Um, travel, adult party, handyman, a little bit different for everybody. Now, what you're looking at here are pages that came out of a scrap rack. So if you're unfamiliar with the scrap rack, that's what those pages are. And they're all they're pocket pages, a bunch of different pocket configurations that hold all different sizes and shapes of embellishments and stickers and die cuts and paper and all that kind of stuff. So that's what these are. They're just pages out of my scrap rack for those categories. So you could kind of see what I was talking about. Section three is the calendar year. January to December or winter, spring, summer, fall, you can organize it any way that you want for this, for wh whether you do seasons or months or both. So really, if you look at my scrap rack in the office, it goes, this calendar year section goes January to June because there's not a lot that goes on in those months for me. And then I have a category called summer, which is kind of a joke because I live in the Pacific Northwest and we don't often get summer, but I still have a summer category that's wishful thinking on my part. And then it moves into the months, individual months, September, October, November, December, because of the different things that my kids do or whatever. So as you start to sort and organize your supplies, you'll get a good sense of what you have and what kind of scrapbooker you are, and um, you'll be able to divide up that category. You know, my sister is a strictly holiday or strictly seasons girl. Her scrap rack goes winter, spring, summer, fall, right? So it's going to vary a little bit by everybody. Again, it's what you think about. So calendar year might look like this. Again, just some pages from my scrap rack. So spring stuff, autumn, fall or autumn things, Halloween things, and then Christmas things all grouped together. The rainbow. This is the final section. And it's the most difficult one for people to get their brains around, right? So um, everything we see for organization are these little containers designed to fit particular things. And getting your brain segmented and fragmented and having to remember about all these little different boxes and bins and drawers and totes, right? That's how everything looks. When you see all those organizing magazines that come out in January, um, everybody has all these beautiful scrapbook or classrooms, and they're just all containerized in these beautiful little containers. But how do you ever find anything in there, right? Well, you don't. You, you don't. You can't rely on your brain for that. Um, you, I've worked with people who have beautiful rooms that are fully containerized, and the frustration level for them is higher than it is for people who just have big, messy rooms, because they feel like, hey, I've got all these neat containers, I have all my stuff in containers, why can't I find anything? And it's because when things are containerized, it's not easy for your brain to follow along. But when you think about just what I told you now about these four sections, if you have your stuff organized into four sections, and you think, oh, I'm going to make a Halloween card, right? You can go right to the October tab in your four-section system and find everything you have for Halloween, whether it's a sticker, a die cut, a brat, a ribbon, a bead, a bow, and boom, instantly you're able to put together that Halloween card or that gift tag or whatever it is. So with the um, rainbow, people really struggle because thinking about mixing your brass and your eyelets and your glitter and your ribbon all together is so outside of everything that we see in the normal sort of presentation world. So what I'm telling you now, combine and conquer should be your new mantra for organization. Keep things together you'll use together, and you will get so much more done. So as you're going through this process, I want you to think about that. Combine and conquer, combine and conquer. Keep things together, I'll use together. And as you get to point, points as you're going through the process of organizing and you kind of get stumped, and you're looking at something, you don't know where to put it, just ask yourself, you know, what would I use this with? I need to keep things together I would use together. And it will make the process of choosing things or filing things away so much easier. All right. I have a double uh, punctuation I just noticed there, both a period and an exclamation point. So here's some examples of the rainbow of just grouping all of those things together, right? 
So um, ribbon and fiber and glass beads and plastic, you know, bingo chips and tiles and bread bag holders and anything you've got by color. So now when you think about something, I need a green eyelet, you just go to your green section. You don't have to remember what box the green eyelets are in and what drawer the box is in and what basket the box is in inside the drawer or whatever it is. You're able to just go directly to that color. So you want to include all of your solid colored products in the rainbow section based on color, including your scraps. So my suggestion, we're going to talk a little bit more about purging, and we're going to talk a little bit more about scraps, is that you, at the end of a project, you get rid of any scrap that's not at least six by six. <gasps> I know, oh, throwing things away. Oh, getting rid of things. Oh, stomach ache, right? Okay, so I used to say, for years I taught this class and I said to people, hey, Choose your minimum scrap size, set a goal, whatever it is, two by three, one by one, card makers use little tiny scraps, right? And um, scrapbookers use bigger scraps, whatever it is, but choose a minimum size. When you're finished with the project, throw away the, anything that doesn't meet your minimum. That was my initial piece of advice. Well, I have modified that advice after years of teaching this class because I have never met, and never is a big word, and I know I shouldn't use it, liberally or easily or casually or whatever, but I have never met a crafter who didn't have enough paper, right? So paper junkies, raise those hands. I can't see you out there in webinar land, but wave your hands around because I know you're out there. Most of you have enough paper that if you threw half your paper away and scrapbooked every day for the rest of your life, you would never run out of paper. You know it. If you're not one of those people, you let me know in the comment section. But that's how most crafters, especially scrapbookers and card makers are, because paper is something we come across and we fall in love with it and we get it. So then we have all these scraps of paper, right? Like, like we need to use those because if we don't use them, we're going to run out. But you're not going to run out, I promise. I promise all of you, you're not going to run out. And if you do run out, you can email me and say, I've run out of paper. And then I will put an email out to my list saying to everybody who's getting ready to do the organization challenge, Box up all your paper and send it to this person, <laughs> and they'll resell you. But I don't think it's going to be a problem. So I've changed my advice. Don't keep anything when you're done with a project that's not at least six by six. What are the benefits to using the rainbow? Um, first of all, it's much easier to find what you need. So going directly to a color, rather than trying to remember where you put red brads, is not only easier, it's also faster, right? So if you just say, I need a red brad, and you flip to your red tab or go to your red section, whether that's a red Ziploc bag or a red binder, you know exactly where to go to get that red thing. The next thing is you see more of what you've got. So if you had in mind that you were going to use a little tiny red brad, and you went to your red section, now all of a sudden you're seeing that you have 10 sizes of red brad, right? You're going to be inspired to use more of those things or things that you've forgotten about. You're also going to learn use more of what you learned. We all take classes or go to crops and events or see demos or any of that kind of stuff. And we tend to work with the products that we've most recently been exposed to. Right? So I did this with my sister. We started scrapbooking at the same time. And um, a few years into it, we got together with scrapbooks and a bottle of wine. And we started flipping through our books. And you literally could chronicle our scrapper's education by going through our books. Because we started off with creative memory. Right? So those are all our pages. And then I remember we felt like we were cheating on our creative memories rep, and we went out and we took a class called Border Basics and Beyond. And then all the pages we flipped through had all these borders, right, all the border basics that we learned. Then we took a class called Paper Dolls. And so then every page had Paper Dolls. And then we you know, learned how to use eyelets. And then it was brads. And then it was a ribbon. And then it was, you know, tattered angels or whatever. But everything that we had most recently learned was evident in the pages that we were currently working on. So. What happens is you use the things that are in front of you, in front, in front of your brain, and also in front of you visually. So by putting all of your things together, now you're going to be reminded of all those other things that you know and that you have, and you're going to use a lot more of what you've got. And then finally, you'll just simply become a better designer, because you'll stop thinking about things in terms of individual items, and you'll start thinking about things in terms of color or texture or whatever, so that um, as a designer, you you're you have a broader reach of products to use, and you start to think more in terms of color than you are thinking in terms of item. <sighs> Deep breath, because the next big step is to purge. 
that word give you a stomach ache? Because I know there's always somebody in one of my classes who I think is going to faint and fall out of their chair when we start talking about purging. It's so hard for us to get rid of things, especially as women. As women, we attach emotionally to everything, right? Something silly, some silly emotional attachment. Um, I attach emotionally to a beautiful ballet embellishment. I have two boys. Some of you know me or have heard me talk about my boys before, but my boys are boy boys, right? Uh, they smell bad. They're hairy. They uh, haven't ever wanted to explore their feminine side or any of that kind of stuff. You know, if one of their little friends handed them a doll to hold while they were when they were little kids, they would hold the doll out as far away from their body and look the opposite direction. Why did I buy a ballet embellishment? I don't know. It's beautiful. And so I attached to this ballet embellishment, and I thought to myself, at some point, one of my children is going to have a little friend in school who's a ballerina and will probably go to her little ballet recital, and then I'll be able to use this embellishment, right? I was attached to it emotionally. I bought it and attached emotionally to something that was completely, in my world, irrelevant. But it took forever for me to get rid of that little ballet embellishment because of that emotional attachment. So some really important things about why am I going on about that, right? You're thinking, why is she talking about this? Because what's important is to recognize that you attach emotionally to things and then attach emotionally to wherever that purge is going, right? So um, if you um, can, can figure out before you even start the organization process what you're going to do with your purge, the stuff that you get rid of, are you going to donate it to your kid's school or the local nursing home or hospital or you know, there are a bazillion charities out there where you can give scrapbooking supplies away. And I know sometimes people are uh, post that up in the question box of places that you can give those things away. But everybody can't see the question box. If you have a good suggestion about where to donate, please feel free to post it up on the Facebook page where there's thousands of people who will see the post. And then they'll get that message, especially if you know something um, immediate. And now when they had the big um, tornadoes, in the southeast, you know, in 2011, I think, we had a lot of ladies donate their purge to women who were scrapbookers who had lost all their stuff. And so now we've just had Sandy. So I'm sure if you're interested in that, there's probably somewhere for people who lost their scrapbooking supplies in Sandy. So that might help you purge. So I guess what I'm saying is find something you can connect to emotionally and use that as your purge motivator. So there's real benefits to purging. First of all, less is more. Less stuff equals less time you spend digging and, and searching through stuff you won't use, okay? So if you're constantly flipping past stuff that you've been looking at for five, six, seven, eight years and never used, all the time and space and energy and creative energy that it's zapped out of you, um, isn't do it's not doing any good to have that thing, right? Not to mention the fact that it's probably dated. So before you start purging, you need to think a little bit about that. How can I get rid of stuff? Some people have to start purging really slowly. So don't feel bad if you just have to kind of ease into it. But I promise you, once you find a place that you're going to donate or decide to sell it, you know, you can, I've had customers bag it up and sell it by the pound on eBay, take it to the local scrapbook store for garage sale day or whatever, and then you can recoup some of your money. If you're donating it, you're going to get a little bit of a tax return there, I mean, a tax break there, too. So there's a couple of different ways to recoup your money. A lot of people think, oh, I've wasted the money. If I, if I purge this, I've wasted the money. Well, you've probably already wasted the money if it's something you bought five or six years ago and you've never used. So consider the money gone. You can recoup some of the money by donating to a local charity, or you can sell it on eBay or sell it at a local scrapbook store, or you could give it to somebody who's scrapping about something who has a ballerina in their life and might actually use it, and then you would feel good about passing that along as well. The other thing you need to do before you start sorting your purge stuff is you need to set a goal. How much are you going to actually get rid of as you start sorting and organizing your supplies? And you can set a goal any way you want. So some people set a goal by the pound. I'm going to purge one pound. Some people say I'm going to, pur in my, I'm going to start a purge box and I'm going to purge one inch of supplies for every year I've been scrapbooking. Um, some people say I'm going to get rid of anything that you know, I've had more than X number of months or X number of years or whatever it is. You do just need to set a goal, write it down, write down what you're going to do with it, whether you're going to sell it or donate it. If you're going to donate it, where are you going to donate it? If you're going to sell it, where are you going to sell it? 
so that you know you're focused on something, right? Goal setting is hugely important. It sounds, seems kind of dumb, right? Like, why is that important? But goal setting is hugely important because of the way that your brain works. So if you set a goal and you meet that goal, then you get this little burst of dopamine that says, you are so cool. You have accomplished something. You have checked something off your list today. You set a goal and you achieved it, right? And then you feel better about it and you're more, more motivated to keep going. So I, I kind of equate this to when I was younger and I used to go to the gym to work out. When I first started going to the gym to work out, there were all these girls there who looked great. They had a makeup, their hair was up, their clothes and shoes and socks and everything was all matchy-matchy. And I thought, what a bunch of goofballs. Why would you get dressed up to come to the gym? But it didn't take me very long to realize that the girls at the gym who looked the best, right, with their hair and their makeup and their matching clothes, were also the girls who were in the best shape. So literally, the fact that they looked good, that they were already achieving their goal, kept them moving forward to stay on that goal. So same kind of thing here. Set a goal, stick with it, you'll feel good about it, and you'll be able to keep moving forward through it. I don't go to the gym anymore, just so you know. Okay, so rules of purging. Once something goes into your purge box, it doesn't come out. If your gut reaction is, what was I thinking when I bought this? That means it should go into the purge box. If you ask yourself, should I put this in the purge box? The answer is definitely yes, right? If you're questioning it, the answer is yes, it goes in the purge box. And then your purge box should be a permanent fixture in your craft area. While you're at it, do you have a permanent Goodwill purge box somewhere in your home? Okay. So if you make your purge box easily and accessible in your craft room, as you finish up a project, when you have those little bits and pieces of things left over that aren't enough to do another project or that you don't want to use again for another project, then you can take those things and you can throw them into the purge box because it's easy, right? And I said that earlier. If it's easy, you'll do it. And if it's not easy, you won't. You'll just leave them in a pile somewhere or stuff them into a box, or throw them into a file drawer, or whatever it is, and then they're just more clutter and more stuff. So make it easy on yourself and keep that purge box handy. It's the same thing with a Goodwill box, right? We all pull things out of the washing machine that belong to our children, or ourselves, or whatever, and think this is too small, or I won't wear this, or I don't need this shed of sheets anymore because I just bought new sheets, or whatever it is. But we end up putting them back in the drawer, back in the closet, or whatever it is, because it's not easy to purge them. So put a purge box somewhere that's easy to get to in your, excuse me, in your front hall closet, in your laundry room, outside the garage door, whatever it is. So when you do come across something that you don't need anymore, you know, the other day I realized that I had like six cupcake pants, which was a necessary thing when I had small children because I was constantly baking several dozen cupcakes for kids' birthdays to take to school or for Halloween parties at school or Christmas parties or whatever. So I needed lots of cupcake pants. But now my children are teenagers, and they no more want me to show up with cupcakes somewhere than they want me to chaperone the high school dance. So I thought, I don't need these anymore. It was time to get rid of them. Well, that purge box being handy makes it easy to get rid of those things. Send them off to the Goodwill. Give them away. Whatever you need to do. But make it easy on yourself. This is my little lecture. Okay, so let's talk about storage tools and space. So the most important aspect we already know are visibility and accessibility right, for your tools, but it's also important for your space. So put some thought into your space. How will you store things so they're the most visible and accessible? And this could mean removing covered doors or adding shelves or something like that. Um, and then decide what tools are you going to use. Are you going to use a scrap bag or binders or file folders or large Ziploc type bags? What's it going to be? Now you can see this picture in the bottom right-hand corner on your screen, and that's actually a picture of my scrapbook room at the office, which is where all my scrapbooking stuff lives at this point in my life. And this room is actually quite large. It was too big to be an efficient room to craft in. So I did a few things to kind of change up the way it was configured. Now the shelf and cabinetry that you see in the back, those were already there. I was kind of stuck with those as well. But I went through the room with this thought process of how do I can make the room smaller and make things more accessible and really use a smaller amount of space more efficiently. So I'm going to go here. This is our website. Um, it's just the scrapwreck.com. And, and so if you're getting ready to do a room, if you just click in from the big pink page, there's that same picture right there um, on the right side. And just click that picture, and it will take you through everything we did 
in that room and why we decided to do it that way and what things we added on and what shortcuts we took. So if you're thinking about organizing a room or space right now um, and you want some tips and tricks about how to make it more efficient, then um, that article is right there with all the pictures and everything. So feel free to use it. Please do use it. Um, okay. So, so we're going to start with paper. Paper is going to be your first challenge, right? So there's a couple of things about paper. You need to be able to figure out how to sort it and store it and organize it, both mentally and physically. So um, when we talk about paper, there are only three sections in the, of the four-section system that we're going to use, themes and sentiments, the calendar year, and the rainbow. And that's because generally um, there is no alphanumeric for um, for paper, right? Usually alphanumeric is alphabets that are going to go, um, they're going to be stickers or something else, they're not just paper. So um, themes and sentiments in the calendar year are generally pretty easy for us to get our brains around. We can all kind of figure out what's a theme or sentiment versus what belongs in the calendar year. Now, there are some things about the calendar year, you know, keeping the things together that you would use together that you have to decide. We've talked about that a little bit already, whether you're going to use holidays and seasons. Um, winter, spring, summer, fall, or month to month. But other than that, it's pretty easy. Rainbow is really where the big challenge comes in. So what do we do with all of those printed papers? And what about papers with multiple colors? Um, how do you handle those? OK, so the first thing that I want you to keep in mind is that comment that I already made. Um, you probably all have enough paper that if you got rid of half your paper, you would still have plenty of paper, and you'd probably still buy a few more sheets of paper. So when you're sorting your paper, don't get hung up on perfection. You want to move through things quickly and easily. You want to look at something and put it away. If you make some mistakes, if a few things end up in the wrong place, it's going to be just fine because you have enough paper that, it's, that those random things go in the wrong place, you're, you're going to be able to find something that you need. And things that were unique, things that you bought with intention, which is probably how you're going to shop after you take this webinar, things you bought with intention are going to end up in the right place. Because when you look at them, you're going to go, oh, I bought that for this, and the, you know that's where you're going to put it. So I'm kind of rambling there, but hopefully that will get clearer as we get through the paper thing here. So. So a general rule of thumb for organizing your colored paper is to start with the solid color first and follow with prints and patterns. So you're going to see some examples here. Then sort your prints into groups within the color. So if you look at my paper, you're going to see that I have solid colors, light to dark, and then I have distressed papers, dots, flowers, plaids, prints, stripes, etc. If you notice those are in alphabetical order because you all know already that I'm a little bit organization obsessed, also known as a CD, so I have to micromanage my papers. And those go right behind the solid colors, but they're always the same. I know that flowers are always going to follow dots and that plaids are always going to follow flowers when I'm looking for something in a colored section. With most multicolored paper, there's one dominant color. Use that color, right? Now, the, there's some exceptions to that as well. We'll, we'll talk about those too, but mostly you're going to go by that dominant color. We talk about double-sided paper, and a lot of times double-sided paper, the, op the two sides of it are completely different. And so knowing, you know, one might be a solid yellow and the other side might be blue flowers, just choose the color that you like the best and put it with that group where you're most likely to use it. If you've got papers that are a rainbow of colors, you can add a multicolored tab at the end of your rainbow section. So I literally have a section at the end of my rainbow section that's called multi, and those are colors that I couldn't determine. And then, again, there, there are things that have a bunch of different colors in them, but so then they're in there by stripes and prints and uh, plaids and flowers and whatever, so all the dots are together, all the florals all together are them in that multi-section. But you, really and truly, I use things by color, and you will find as you become a designer, with an eye for color as opposed to an eye for stuff, that going through that color section is going to be how you figure out what to use. And just being able to thumb through the corners of those papers is really going to make it easy. So we'll, we'll, I'll show some examples of what that looks like, too. OK, what are the exceptions? Remember that one of your biggest goals is to be able to find things quickly and easily. And that means keeping things together you will use together. Combine and conquer. This is true with paper as well. So as an example, 
if you bought pink floral paper for your daughter's ballet pages, you want to store that paper with the rest of the ballet stuff so you'll find it. So even though when you look at the pink floral paper, there's nothing about it that says ballet, you bought it with the intention of using it with ballet, so then that paper is going to go in your themes A to Z section under B for ballet, so that when you're working on those ballet pages, can you, you think I'm a little bit obsessed with ballet, considering I don't have any that does ballet in my life. Um, but that's where you're going to find that paper. So as you buy things, as you buy things, as I say, with intention, you want to put it away with intention. That's one of the other really amazing things about using the four-section system, right? <sighs> to take a deep breath here, I get so excited. So one of the amazing things about using the four-section system is once you start with it, and notice I said start. It doesn't have to be finished. It doesn't have to be complete. You just have to start it. Anything new you bring into your scrapbook room space, whether that's a closet, a tote, a room, two rooms, the garage, whatever, anything new you bring in, you know where to put it. So if you went to the scrapbook store yesterday and you bought um, a new, the new basic grade Christmas collection, you can take it out of the bag and you can go right to your four section system to December and you can drop the four set, the Christmas um, paper pack right into your Christmas section, right? Because you know where it's going to go. If you bought, let's say you bought soccer paper and you haven't even started a soccer section yet or a sports section yet or whatever, but you know that's what it, where it's going to go. So you can take those things you bought for soccer and if you haven't started a sports section, you start a sports section, put it in things B to Z and X and you know where it is. That way when you're ready to scrap sports, you can go right to there, you're going to see the soccer stuff. It's not going to end up stuck in the bag under your desk or in the closet or somewhere else where you can't find it and you don't remember that you bought it anyway. So it's so amazing. Once you start using it, not only is it easier to actually craft because you can find stuff quickly, it's easier to add things and it's easier to clean things up. I think I already said that when I get on my little tie right here. So, okay, here's another exception, kits and stacks, right? If you're a member of a kit club like Club Scrap and you get a pizza box full of goodies every month, don't try to take the kit apart. Don't try to reinvent anything that kind of all comes together. Because the truth is, if it's come together like that, you're probably going to use it together. So you want to figure out a way to incorporate or to remind yourself that you have that kit. So with Club Scrap, I'm going to skip a screen here. So here's some Club Scrap kits, right? So this January 2011 Lotus Pond kit, that's all the stuff that came in the kit. It's a spring kit, so I'm going to take that color flyer and I'm going to file it in the spring section and I'm going to write on it, uh, January 2011, Lotus Pond, box number 105. And then every time I get a new box from Club Strap, I'm going to give the box a number and put it in a stack. And I'm going to file a flyer that wherever it belongs. And I might, be, I might have to put it in a couple of different places. So if this particular theme, um, fit more than one category. Let's say I had a whole category called, um, I don't know, called uh, frogs and lily pads. I would put a copy of this flyer in spring and then I would put a copy of it in frogs and lily pads. So no matter which thing I was looking for, that flyer would pop up and I would know exactly where to go to get box number 105. I could pull it out of the middle of the stack and I could put it back in the middle of the stack quickly and easily and I could really use the pieces of that kit. Now, when I get to the point that the kit is, um, there's not a lot of pieces left, then I can just take those spare pieces, throw them into a storage page if I'm using a scrap rack or into a Ziploc bag if I'm not or whatever I'm using, and then put them right into the spring section or whatever. So you want to keep the things together that you would use together, but at the point that that box is way bigger than it needs to be, then you can incorporate kind of the leftovers in wherever they would belong. So especially with... <clears throat> With this kit, you know, it had a variety of, of plain colored cards and stuff. So then if I had used up most of the kit, I would just file the cards into, you know, in the color section. So I would see them and use them once I was done with everything else. Okay, paper stacks. <sighs> Another thing that we get a great buy on, right? They're normally $20, but I have my 40% off coupon at Michael's. So instead of paying $20 for it, I pay $12 for it. So I paid $12 for 50 sheets of paper. It was a great deal. It was a special edition. It was whatever it was, but they got my 12 bucks, and now I have this stack of paper, and I'm not sure how to store it. Again, you don't want to take it all apart. Generally, stacks are going to all be one theme or one sort of color group or one 
uh, holidays and seasons or whatever they are. So, you know, here's a couple of varieties of them in different categories. But what you want to do is work them in to the rest of your paper um, storage area. So there's two here that I'm working with. One of them on the upper left side is called sports. It's called all boys sports or something. But it has a very vintage sports look, but it's all sports. So all I did was take a little self-adhesive tab from the office supply store, a little bit labeling tab, and I stuck it to the chipboard back of the um, the stack, and I put the little tab in that said it was sports and vintage. Now I can incorporate that right onto my paper shelf with the rest of my sports paper. So it might not fit directly in if I'm using a paper storage box or some other sort of system or shelf, but I can put it right next to it. And I can stand it up on its edge and read the tab. So I don't have to stack my stack and take up 12 inches by 12 inches of space that I have to pull out something from the bottom or the middle. Once you tilt it on its side and stand it up and you know what it is, then you can pull it out um, off the shelf much easier. And I've got some pictures coming up of that too. So it'll make a little bit more sense. And again with the seasonal one. So this is all seasons, right? So how can I put that in winter, spring, summer, fall if I don't pull them apart? Don't pull things apart if you don't have to. Or I mean. Maybe there might be a few of you out there that have plenty of time and you can take apart those stacks and file each paper in the right section. But for most of us, just knowing that it's seasonal paper and putting it in the calendar year, like at the very beginning of the calendar year section in our paper storage, is going to allow us to see it, remember that we have it, thumb through it, see if there's something in there that we need and use it. What I really want you to do, though, every time you buy a stack of paper, is I want you to write the date and the price on the back of it date you bought it and the price you paid for it. And then every time you come across it, I want you to flip it over and look at that date and that price. And then each time you buy, each time you use something, make a little hash mark on it. And that way you'll know you'll be a better educated consumer. You will be able to say, yes, I use these stacks. They're a great value for me. Or you'll be able to go, hey, I spent $12 on this. I've never used a piece of paper out of it. Or I spent $12 on it. I've only used one piece of paper. That's pretty expensive for a single piece of paper. So you'll just shop better, shop with intention, I guess. I'm going to go back to that. And I have friends, I have a girlfriend named Liberty, who she'll do an entire album with a single stack of paper, right? So it's a great value for her. Um, and then I know other people who have dozens of stacks that they've never cracked open. So figure out who you are just by making some notes on the back so that you can shop with intention. And regardless of your financial situation, um, just even if you could afford to buy every stack on the planet, can you afford the time and the space to store every stack on the planet? So you really want to ask yourself that as you're going through the process. Just because I can afford it, am I really going to use it? And do I have the time and the space to store it? Those are equally important questions. The other thing, once you start using the four section system that's going to happen as you're shopping, is when you go to the scrapbook store or scrapbook event, when you pick something up off the shelf, you're going to think to yourself, this is really cool. W you know, what am I going to do with it? Okay, it's Christmas paper. Okay, so that when I get home, I'm going to store it in the Christmas section. Do I have a need for this? Boy, I think I already have this. As a matter of fact, I bought this last year. So once your brain has that four-section system and you've put everything away, your brain naturally makes connections, right? So you, it's easier for you to remember what you have. So you're not going to be buying duplicates. It's easier for you to remember that you have, you know, a hundred soccer stickers. So you don't think, do I need a soccer sticker? Your brain says no. As a matter of fact, you have, you know, a hundred soccer stickers. So once you start organizing, there's all these sort of ripple effects that are just kind of amazing. So, all right. So, how do you sort your paper? There's two ways to sort paper. So you can use templates, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, Twelve by eighteen paper works best for making those templates. Or you can use dividers in paper storage boxes, um, so chipboard, sheets, um, cardboard, or even un unwanted cardstock will make a decent divider. What are we going to do with those scraps? We'll talk about those too. We talked already about choosing a minimum size, and I'm really going to encourage you, if you can do it, if you can make the thought of getting rid of anything that's not at least six by six, um, I would really encourage you to do that. And that will allow you to toss out extras when your project is complete, if you have that kind of goal already set up. So on the left side, there are some pictures of sorting templates. And these are 12 by 18 sheets of paper. 
this uh, they, this tablet of paper came from the dollar store. It was obviously a dollar. So construction paper also comes in 12 by 18, but it's a little bit more expensive. So if you've got a dollar store handy, that's what I use. And I just drew a five inch line down one side, and that's where I put the, my different sections. So you can see there's one for letters, numbers, and punctuations, and there's one for um, you know reds and pinks and spring, and then B, which would be themes and sentiments, B, baby, beach, birthday. So this allows you to kind of list all the different things that you have in your themes list right down the page. So that's another thing. When you make your sorting templates for sorting paper, um, you can use the themes list that you've created, and what that's going to be part of your assignment to create that themes list. And so once you've created your themes list, then it's easy to create the templates for sorting. So you're going to take your sorting templates and spread them out all around the house. And that's how, how, literally how I did it. My living room, my dining room run together. I took these 12 by 18 sheets of paper and I made just trails of them around the house. And then I was able to walk along with piles of paper, dropping that paper on each one of those templates as I went along. And so it made it easy for me to be very visual and very tactile about that sorting process. Now, the alternative to that is to use boxes and, and some kind of divider. So these um, cardboard boxes are the Scrap Rack brand paper storage boxes. They're out of stock right now. We do have the plastic um, Cropper Hopper paper storage boxes in um, on the website. Um, so those are available if you're looking for paper storage boxes. But I just took chipboard sheets. And again, with the self-adhesive um, tabs from the office supply store. And then I could sit down with a pile of paper and I could literally file paper into whatever, whatever category it belonged in. So I used my themes list to create the dividers here. Um, not as easy to map out the name of each theme, so I just had to go, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, as opposed to being able to sort a little bit more um, specific to theme using the template strategy. But you can see kind of the two different ways to do that. One takes a little more room than the other. Um, but it has some other benefits in terms of tearing things down more specifically. So once I have those papers segmented, all the B stuff together, if it was in the boxes or on the template, then I was able to take that pile of B papers and sort all the beach stuff into one pile and all the birthday stuff into another pile. And so what you're looking at here is those papers sorted, and then I put like all the birthday stuff into a super size single and all the beach stuff into a super size single. And super size single just means uh, that's just the name of that big pocket. It's actually 12 and a half by 12 and a half. It'll easily fit those papers in it. So now you could put these pages right onto your scrap rack, or you could take that whole pocket and put it right into a paper storage box. There's a couple of different ways to store paper once you've got it sorted. You're going to see them both. And so if you put it into the paper storage box, <coughs> Um, again, I just slid those pockets in there behind the tab, and you can stick a little self-adhesive tab right on the edge of the pocket page as well. So you could label the beach pocket page, beach, and the birthday pocket page, birthday, and then slide them in behind the B tab. So what you're looking at here is a paper storage box that's been turned over on its back. So if you're already using paper storage boxes and you're using them the way they were intended, straight up and down, if you turn them over and lay them on their backs, then you can pull the paper in and out of the boxes pretty easily. So here's two different sort of examples. So we've got the paper storage boxes on the right, and you can see, um, in, so the tabs go back to sports, and then you can see the edge of that sports stack in there. So I was able to stand that sports stack up right between the two paper storage boxes. So when I was looking for sports stuff, it was going to pop up for me. I was going to remember that I had it, and then I might actually be able to use it. Now, what you're looking at on the left side is a gal who's got six scrap racks. She's got a double, two base units hooked together on each one of those shelves. She literally has a ton of paper. So she's got two racks just loaded up. Um, well, it looks like just loaded up with paper. And then her bottom rag is her holidays and seasons where she has more embellishments there as well. So here are some more paper storage boxes that kind of fit more with the paper junkies that I know many of us, many of you, maybe all of us are. So, um, and so the paper storage boxes on the top, obviously that's the rainbow and it, they're tipped over on their back. 
and then the paper storage boxes down on the bottom shelf are um, the themed papers there too. And what you're looking at in the bottom um, left-hand corner is just a picture of a scrap rack, and it's from the back. So one of the things that people have trouble with when they set up their scrap rack is they set it up so the part that you're looking at at the back is tipped over so it's like the base, and then the scrap rack is at two steep of an angle. It still works. People still love it, but it'll if you're using a scrap rack now and you don't see that the um, website embossed on the back, then um, you're going to want to tip your scrap rack over. They'll love it even more. Okay, so we talked already a little bit about scraps. Um, so this is prior to my deciding I wasn't going to keep anything that wasn't at least six by six. So if you can't get behind the six by six thing, Storing your scraps by size is really important. Again, you get that visual part of, um, of, of being able to find things quickly and easily. So small scraps grouped together in smaller pocket pages, bigger scraps in bigger pocket pages. And that way you'll be able to see them and actually get your hands on them quickly and easily. If you're using file folders, you can do the same thing in your paper storage boxes with your scraps. So you can see in the left picture, there's a file folder at the very front of the red and pink section. And then it looks like it's a legal size file folder, but that's just the camera angle. It's actually just an 8.5 by 11 file folder. And if you're using an 8.5 by 11 file folder, the answer is yes, your 12 by 12 paper is going to stick out um, the edges of it. But that's okay because you're putting it in a 12 by 12 box. So that file folder is just holding everything together. And you open it up. You can see small scraps in the front and larger scraps toward the back. And then there's just a picture, the last picture there in this series is just kind of what it looks like straight on. So you can easily put a file folder of scraps in each color section, and that makes it really easy to put those scraps away again as well. OK, so how do you store your paper? You've seen a couple of different ways. You can use paper storage boxes with file folders for scraps. You can use a scrap rack with pocket pages for scraps. Or you can do a little bit of both. So minor themes will have all their papers stored in the scrap rack by the theme. So let's take that. Let's go back to ballet. If I had 10 sheets of ballet paper, I'd put them in a super size single pocket. I'd put it right into the ballet section of my scrap rack. If I had 1,000 sheets of Christmas paper, I'm not going to put 1,000 sheets of paper in my scrap rack or in a binder or wherever, whatever Ziploc bag or whatever I'm using. I'm going to put it in a paper storage box under Christmas. I'm probably going to have a Christmas paper storage box. Now, here's some of the things about using paper storage boxes that's really great. You can put your paper storage boxes labeled in the four-section system, I know it's only three because we don't have alphanumeric, on your shelf. And that way when you're working, if you're going to work on Christmas, you can go to the shelf and you can pull the entire Christmas box or the entire you know, fall winter box or whatever is off the shelf and bring it to your workspace and sit on the table. And the paper storage box is only three and a half inches wide. It's 12 inches long, but it's three and a half inches wide. So you can put that box on your table. You can thumb through the papers really easily without bending or damaging them. But you're not taking up 12 by 12 space on your work table. You can take that entire Christmas paper box and drop it into your crop tote. So if you're going to an event and you're going to work on Christmas stuff at the event, you can drop that into your crop tote and take all your Christmas paper with you. And when you come home, you can take that Christmas paper box out of your crop tote and put it right back on the shelf where it belongs. So once you get everything into that four-section system, going to an event becomes really simple as well, just because you've set yourself up to be able to have those things portable and to be able to take only the things that you need to work with when you're going to that crop or class. So for most people, doing a little bit of both works best. Mixing some papers into your basic storage tool and for minor categories and themes, and then major categories and themes being stored in paper storage boxes. Tips for paper sorting success. Do things in small pieces. Be sure that you have enough time to complete the task that you are doing. So one thing that happens with organization is we start a big project, and we spread our stuff out all over the place, and we forget that we're having company over for dinner. So even though we spent all day spreading stuff out all over the place, now we have to gather it all back up and dump it into a tote and stuff it in the guest bedroom or wherever while we clean up for our dinner guests. And that becomes frustrating because the next time you look at that organization project, your brain says, wow, that didn't work. You have to come up with something new. And so then 
that really wasn't the problem. Really, the problem was not that you didn't have a good idea, but that you didn't have time to execute it, so you ended up with more of a mess. So it's important that you do little things, little steps that you can finish all the way through, even if that means only sorting one inch of paper into categories and then filing those categories and then sorting another inch of paper and filing those categories. It's much better to work through slow blocks like that and not get overwhelmed and not get frustrated than it is to try and take on sorting, you know, three feet of paper all at once and risk maybe not being able to finish it and having to dump it all back together. So. Set up your minimum scrap size before you begin. Um, if you're using paper storage boxes and dividers, sticky notes work great in the initial, going through the initial sorting process so you can change them around pretty quickly and easily. And then of course when it comes to color, you want to be in natural light whenever possible. So, excuse me, sort in natural light whenever you can. Okay, so your basic training mission statement for this week, or your mission checklist for this week, is to read through the four-section system if you still have questions about how it works. And there's an article right on our website about the four-section system. So if you go, oops, that's not where I wanted to go. I want to go back to the website. Here we go. So once you click into our website, there's this tab up at the top that says Learn. If you click on that Learn tab, and then you can scroll down, there's Meet the Four-Section System video. And so that's a picture of me like going through the four, or a video of me going through the four section system physically, sort of showing you what that looks like. And then you can scroll down and there's other video choices and there's a couple of different articles here, but the four section system for scrapbook supply organization, it also works for card makers. But so if you need more information about the four section system or you want a little bit more clarity, you can find that right there on the learn tab on once you log into the scrap rack website. Okay. Okay, so if you need that, that's where you can help. The next thing you're going to do is create your themes index. And the themes index is going to um, guide you through the sorting process, not only for paper, but for everything else, the themes and sentiments. If you can gather all your supplies into one room or space, it's really going to make it a lot easier to do all three challenges in the boot camp challenge, because everything's in one place. It's a little bit easier to tackle. You want to set your purge goals, get a purge box, find a home for your purge. Where will you send it, take it? When will you take it there? Evaluate your space for visibility and accessibility. Make changes and prepare space for your supplies. You want to create a space where you're going to put everything away that's for organized only stuff. I would just strongly recommend that you join the 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group on Facebook. Um, just because it's such a great group of highly entertaining ladies. So if you don't, um, if you're not a Facebooker, then that's okay. Um, it's not, I mean, you know, it's not going to make or break your success here, but it is a great group where, and there are people in the group from all over the world. So no matter what time of day you're up or, or night you're up and you have a question, there's going to be somebody there that can help you um, or answer a question for you almost all the time. Um, complete the set yourself up for success checklist. So these are the thing, basic things you can do to be successful with almost anything, not just this challenge. First of all, set a goal. So if your goal is to complete this, uh, the basic training, you know, it, over the course of the next week, then that's your first goal. So you're going to set that goal. You're going to write it down. Um, so goals not put to paper are intentions that are seeds without soil. They're just going to blow away. Nothing's going to happen. So write the goal down and post it somewhere you can um, see it. Recruit a friend. It's always easier to get something done when you know somebody else is depending on you or working with you or if you're competitive, racing with you or whatever it is, but it's always easier when there's a friend or another person involved with you. It could be a sister or your mom or somebody else, but if you can get a friend to get organized as well, then you're going to have somebody that kind of cheers you on, that you can cheer on, whatever. You know how that works. So tell anyone who will listen what you're doing. Again, the more people that you tell, the more obligated you feel to follow through and get it done because they're going to ask you about it later, right? They're going to say, hey, how is that going? How much are you getting done? What did you do this week? And then you're going to feel like, oh, no. I, and so you kind of put that pressure on yourself to actually follow through and finish things up. Get the buy-in from anyone who might interrupt your progress. If there's somebody who you think is going to try to distract you from getting your organization project done or any project, this, this success checklist works regardless of what kind of project you're doing. But so before you start, if you think there's somebody that's going to 
put a hitch in your get along, get the buy-in from them. And so when I say get the buy-in, it could be something as simple as when I went through this first organization process, I, we set up these goals that we do with the um, Get Organized Challenge. I have two boys, right? And I want them to leave me alone while I'm doing my organization task. So I set myself up for success by sort of bringing them into it. And I said to London, my older son, hey, if I get this done on time, then I will take you to Starbucks for coffee and cribbage, two things he loves to do, right, just the two of us. And so then that would encourage him not to bother me. And it would also encourage him to um, distract my other son, Max, from bothering me when I was trying to get something done. And so then I built in the same buy-in for Max. Okay, Max loves pizza and ping pong. So here's the deal, Max. If I get my work done, then um, we'll order pizza and I'll challenge you to a night of ping pong. We'll get root beer, we'll live large, whatever. So I had the buy-in from those guys. They weren't going to distract me from what I was doing. In fact, they were going to support me in what I was doing because the buy-in was there. So set buy-in before somebody um, interrupts you or, or, or prevents you from doing it. And then pick a reward you want to work for. So for some people, the reward is going to be simple. I just want to be more organized. I just want to be able to have more to spend the time that I'm doing scrapbooking and actually get things done. That's going to be my reward. Right? Some people say that. I would not recommend that. I would recommend some other reward outside of that. You're already going to get that. You're already doing that. That's already a side effect of taking on this challenge. So find some other reward, whether it's lunch with a girlfriend. Um, many people have said, when I complete the challenge, I'm going to buy myself a scrap rack. That's going to be their big reward. But you might just, I just want to go for a walk and get a coffee and eat a chocolate bar, whatever it is. Choose a reward that you are actually going to um, be inspired to work for. It could be big and it could be small. Um, everybody's a little bit different, but it helps. You're going to create an organized only space. And this is an empty space where you're just going to put things away that are organized. So in this first um, sorting paper challenge that you're going to do over the next week, you need to find a place where you can put paper storage boxes or binders or file folders or whatever it is that you're using to organize your paper and um, put it there. And that space is only for things that have been organized in that four-section system. And that way, as you start to bring other products into your four-section system, they're going to go in that organized only space as well. So you always have a place to put things that are have been sorted. You've got to choose your storage tool, obviously, um, for paper. You have to create a template um, or dividers for sorting. The big goal is to sort at least eight inches of paper, so a little over an inch a day over the next seven days before we meet again. Sort your scraps and throw away scraps that don't meet your minimum requirements. Put your newly organized paper into your organized only area of your room or space. And then post to the Facebook group what you've accomplished this week. Now, posting to the Facebook group is an important part of the whole puzzle because um, I'm going to choose a winner every week of somebody who has progressed through that, this Get Organized Challenge. So you don't have to do 100% every week. You just have to post that you're making progress and what you're doing. Now, if you're not on Facebook, then you can email customer service at thescraprack.com and just put progress post in the um, email header, and uh, Joanna will get that over to me, and I will include that right into um, the drawing for whatever. So if you don't post on, if you post on Facebook, you need to head it progress post, or you can email me and say that, or email us at customer service at thescraprack.com that you've what your progress is and we'll include you in the drawing every week. But that really keeps you connected and there's a little prize incentive also there. So there is your big challenge for this first week. Oh my gosh, I just feel like I've just been spewing information on you for the last hour or however long it's been. So I'm going to open up my question pane now. So for those of you who have had questions, now I have to apologize because I know you guys all get this funky little black flashing box. Um, on your screen when I open up the pane. So I apologize for that. I don't actually see the black flashing box, but it's one of the flaws with GoToWebinar. So let's go ahead and open up our um, question pane here, and I will, let's see, I need to make it a little bigger so I can read everything. Ta -da. Um, uh, Glenda popped on and says, hi, Tiffany, here we go. Do I ever need this right now? Glenda is 
um, a regular participant in the Get Organized Challenge and an avid crafter, and she's moving into a small house, so she's in need of some serious organization. Melba asked, so I'll read the questions and then I'll give the answer. Sometimes I forget to say who asked the question and it sounds kind of weird, but just know that's what I'm doing. Melba asks, hi Tiffany, I'm very excited to hear you. Hopefully I will learn a lot. Main question, why in the heck can't I get completely organized? I have started over and over and over. And I think I probably answered that question in the beginning. And what happens with the organization systems, why they fail is because we start with one thing, we start organizing things, and then for some reason we outgrow the containers or they don't make that container anymore, so we can't get it, or we move to a new place and we think we have a better idea, so we're going to try this or that. So we keep like going through all the tools, but what you really need is that system. So once you start following that four section system and you know where to put new things when they come into your um, boomer space and you know where to find the things that you need and where to put things away when you're done and it becomes very easy, then it's easy to stay organized. So hopefully, Melba, this will be the answer once you get your things into that four section system. And so we're going to kind of power through those three classes this uh, month of November, but after that, you're probably going to see, you're going to make huge leaps. I just know it. It's so, I mean, we have, just have had so many people so successful from the Get Organized Challenge. So, Lee says, is there a way to print your screens and create a note taker? I'm not sure what a note taker is, um, but I will download the PDFs for this and I will post them on the um, organization boot camp page. So, um, and you will all get an email from me after the session um, that has a link to the organization boot camp page and kind of recaps the things that I talked about and the different links or whatever. So, and you know, the customer service email address and all those good things. So you'll get an email probably tomorrow with all those details and the link back. And I will, um, I will save the screens as a PDF and I will post them on that page. So anybody that wants to download the screens um, and either print them out or have them can do that. Um, Diane says, cute thing. Thank you. My little butterfly camouflage there. Um, Wynn says, where in the rainbow goes two-sided paper, two different colors? And so we did kind of talk about that. Choose the side that you, the color that you like the best and just go with that or the color you're most likely to use and go with that. Um, Sherry says, I like having my alphabets filed in colors. Wondering if I want to change that. Hmm. So my suggestion to you, Sherry, is to try it. Um, just give it a shot, right, because it's easy. Um, to put things back in color if it doesn't work for you. But I think that what you'll find is once you have your alphabets grouped by size, a couple of things happen. First of all, what I talked about already with the Fourth of July thing, so you can find more things, um, more letters that you need that fit that that uh, size group or that color you know, combination or whatever, they're all right there. But the other thing is when you're flipping through, when you're going to build that tag or title or whatever you need, those alphabet stickers, Right now, if you're thinking in color, oh, I'm going to do this with red letters, and you go to red, that's all you see is red. And so you might have completely forgotten that you had red and white polka dots or that you had, you know, blue and red polka dots or whatever, or that you had, you know, some other red and green striped letters or whatever, something that might work together because you didn't see them in that color group. So by flipping through that, you're probably going to be more inspired and use a little bit more of what you've got. The other thing is, for those people who like to collage things together and use a variety of different fonts and shapes and sizes and colors for that sort of collage look, it makes it really easy to do that because you really see a big variety of what you've got in that sense. So especially because they're grouped by kind of by size together, so you get things that are similar sizes as well. Um, uh, let's see. Lori Ann says, do you foresee any issues with including seasons and holidays as themes? Yes. I'm so glad you asked that, Lori Ann, because I should have talked about it. The reason that you want to keep your calendar separate from your theme is because you want to keep things together that you would use together, right? So if you put your fall stuff under F for fall and your Halloween stuff under H for Halloween and your Thanksgiving stuff under T for Thanksgiving, now, if you're working on fall or Thanksgiving or Halloween pages, all three of those categories might have leaves or pumpkins or scarecrows or trees with no leaves on them or any of those sort of cornucopia turkeys, stuff that might work all across the fall spectrum. 
they're going to be spread out in three different categories. So instead of going to fall and seeing all the things that might work together, you have to remember that you've spread them out in three or four different categories, and then you have to look through three or four different categories to find them. So there's one thing. The other really big thing, well, equally big, I guess, is if you're going to go to a proper class and you're going to work on your fall pages, if you have all your fall stuff together, so fall, Halloween, Thanksgiving, all together, you're going to go to that event, you just pull that one section off your scrap rack. If you're using a scrap rack, you know, kind of velcro it all together. So you take that section or you take your Ziploc bag for that theme or your binder for that theme and you're out the door in just a minute with everything you need to work on that fall project. But again, if you have it spread out in three or four different places, you have to remember all three or four of those places, and then you have to go through and gather those things from three or four different places or three or four different areas in storage rather than going by the calendar year. So it is really important, especially if you're a card maker, right? Because again, all those things, pumpkins and leaves and whatever, squirrels and trees with no leaves and acorns, cornucopia, they're all going to work together for those fall cards. You don't want to spread them out into three or four categories. So thank you for asking that. They usually talk about it. Um, where do you store a kit for pages? So those kits for pages are going to go with whatever category they belong in, right? So if you have a page kit that's for ballet, it's going to go in ballet. If you have a page kit for Christmas, it's going to go in Christmas. If you have a page kit that's just a colored page, it's going to go in color, right? Just keep it all together in that package that it came in and put it right in that section where it belongs. The same thing if you go to an event and you make a page, like you take a class and you make a page that's called, uh, I don't know, Fall Family or whatever, but you don't really have pictures for it, take that page and put it right into the fall section so that when you get some fall pictures and you're flipping through that section looking for what to use, boom, there's that page that you created at your proper class or event or whatever, so you're actually going to use it. You created Disney pages, they're going to go in your Disney section or your amusement park section or whatever you have. Mother's Day page is going to go in that um, spring Mother's Day section so that when you have the pictures of your mom and you're doing Mother's Day, boom, it's going to pop up for you. That's really the key to this whole thing is you want to put things where you would use them. Keep things together you would use together so that they're going to pop up for you and you're actually going to use them. So it's a great question also. Thank you. Um, Sarah says, who won the prize? There is no prize for the, for the first one because this is our first one. Um, Melba said, Pattern paper is what is so hard to organize, and it is hard to organize, but go do what I suggested. Just try it. I promise you, once you start doing it, it gets so easy, but we really have to sort of let ourselves go about the perfectionist side of sorting that paper. So if it's mostly red, put it in the red section. If it's mostly blue, but you loved the green in it because it made you think of spring and you were going to use it on your Easter pages, then put it in Easter. But move quickly through it, and don't worry if you mess some stuff up, because you probably have plenty of paper that even if a few things end up in the wrong place, are going to be just fine. Like I said, I haven't met anybody yet who had a shortage of paper. Melanie says, we had a wildfire come over the mountain into the neighborhood in Colorado Springs the past summer. I know of several Stampin' Up! people who lost everything in their homes burned. That's a good place for my perch to go. My friend who I was giving it to is already overwhelmed with... And then the, the sentence ends. But Melanie's exactly right. Find someone or something that you're connected to, and then it makes it really easy to clean things out, to purge things out, and share them with somebody who needs them or who will use them. Lori Ann says, I have had recent success purging by taking my purge to crops and giving it away. Perfect. Just know where you're going to take it. So if you've got a crop coming up and you think that you can give some of it away at the crop, set a goal. I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to take three inches of stuff from my scrapbook collection. I'm going to take it to the crop, and I'm going to share it at the crop with anybody who needs it. I'm going to give it away at the crop. There's always new people, too, who are just getting started, and there's always women. I should, I should, there's a few men out there, too, but there are always people who are on a budget, and they're so thankful for things that you don't think that you'll use. Um, and it could be the difference between them getting to scrapbook or not. So um, there's tons of places to share that. Janet said, purging, Does, doesn't deciding whether or not you will need something somewhat hinge on if you are caught up on your scrapbooking of tons of photos to eventually scrapbook, but I still have to complete the sorting process. <laughs> um, here's the thing that you want to be cautious of when we talk about purging. Um, 
um, <laughs> there's always a reason not to purge. There's always an excuse not to purge. There's always, you can always come up with some reason not to get rid of something, right? So you want to kind of try and stay away from that thinking because there's always going to be the opportunity to buy new and different stuff. Now, again, I'm, I'm speaking in generality. I know there are people who have lots of money to spend on scrapbooking. People have very little money to spend on scrapbooking. Those people are somewhere in the middle, right? So knowing yourself as a scrapbooker, are you going to use something 10 years from now <laughs> that might be out of date or a technique that no one's using anymore, that you don't like the looks of anymore, or color palette that's not popular anymore, whatever it is. Scrapbooking is a fashion-forward hobby. So keep that in mind. The more you have to dig and search through things to find what you actually want to work with, the less scrapbooking you're actually going to be getting done. So try to temper what you're purging with just this dose of common sense. I've had this for five years. I've never used it. I could probably put it in the purge box because I have enough stuff. Um, to be honest with you, there are very few scrapbookers that I've come across <laughs> in the last oh, 10 years of teaching that don't have enough stuff. Most of us have enough stuff that we could scrapbook every day for the rest of our lives and still not run out of stuff. So just keep in mind who you are and how you scrapbook. And some people are really good about using what they have before they go out and buy new stuff. And some people, the total joy of this hobby is always having the latest and greatest and trying the newest techniques and all the whole fashion forward side of it. So who are you and where do you fall in that spectrum? And that'll really guide you through purging. Um, but the other thing that I think is going to happen for you, or I hope is going to happen for you after taking this class, is that you're going to change the way you think about buying things. And again, not so much from the financial side of it, but just from the, um, the perspective of if I have less stuff that's more appropriate to what I'm working on now, I'm going to get more done. So you're going to buy things with intention and know exactly what you're going to use them with when you buy them. And at some point, your brain is going to say, okay, you have a good intention for that, whatever, maybe it's for Christmas this year, but you're not going to work on Christmas this year for a long time. So put it down, go over to the soccer section and buy the soccer stickers that you need for the project you're working on now and finish that project and then come back and buy the Christmas stuff when you're ready to do it. Because chances are, by the time you're ready to do that Christmas project, there's going to be some other new cool thing out there that you're going to want to use for that. So just kind of keep that in mind. And really, as your brain tries to rationalize keeping everything and purging nothing, think ahead to, if I had a, less stuff to dig through, I would actually be getting more done. And then that feels good on a number of levels uh, because you're actually using the stuff that you have, but also your family, <laughs> for a lot of us, our husbands, um, are seeing you produce things instead of just collect things, and so they become more supportive of your hobby also. So there's all these sort of outside things that are part of this, the mental process of organizing that we don't often consider when we're containerizing things. But if you kind of try to think through the whole process of purging and the benefits of what it's going to be and then work backwards through it, then it's going to help you make those purging decisions. And I'll be honest with you, I have had people, I mean, we've had thousands of people take this class. The vast majority of people get to a comfort zone with purging, what they're purging, how they're purging, who they're purging to, all that stuff. There are some people that go bananas and purge 75% of their stuff. And there are some people who struggle throwing away every, you know, two-by-two two scrap of paper, even though they know, they know that they won't use it. So just find that comfort level. And um, once you start purging, I'm going on and on here. But once you start purging and you realize nothing bad is happening and that you're not missing out on anything and you're not, not having the supplies you need, it becomes easier to get rid of the stuff that you're not um, using so that you can use it, get more done with the stuff you are using. I'm sorry, I think I went a, lot, a little long for that. I'm very passionate about the purge. Uh, What's the best way to store stamped and matching dies? Should we store them somehow so we have them stored together, or should we keep them separate? I'm especially confused about spellbinder dies, which should have, this is from Glenda, sorry, which could have stamps that match them for more than one stamp company, or there are other companies to, who have spellbinders company manufacturer their own designs or custom designs for them to go. I have so many combinations of these um, spellbinders, frameless, my favorite things. Uh, dynamic dies, etc. So 
I could go a whole hour just on stamps and punches and dies and how to put those things together. So Glenda, I hate to tell you this, but I'm not going to answer your question until lesson three of this challenge. <laughs> it's because we don't have time to go into it. But basically, you do need to come up with a way to keep things together that you're going to use together, and that's going to mean cataloging those dies and stamps and punches that all go together together in the same place. And we'll talk about that in challenge number three above and beyond. I'm sorry, I know that's a horrible um, question. Carla says, will the presentation be available on the site after the class is over? Yes, it will be. I'm going to record it. It's being recorded right now. And then we'll upload it to YouTube and post it on the site so you can watch it whenever it's convenient for you. Melanie says, I do have some die cut with a view paper that has alphabets and numbers on it. I just put them in the rainbow section according to color. So yeah. So, and usually those are, I mean, it's going to vary by what they're, what they're for. So, I think I have that same die cuts with the view paper, actually. Mine's all black and white, and it's in the black and white section, now that you mentioned that. I bet that's the same, the same paper. But, yeah, so it's really generic. I did the same thing as you did, and I just put it in the color section. If it was alpha new alphabets that looked like grade school alphabets, you know, on lined paper or whatever, then it's probably going to end up in school. Um, so, but um, more alphabet tag titles, journaling kind of thing. Um, Sarah said, does multi in your rainbow section equal miscellaneous? <laughs> She's just teasing because there is no miscellaneous in organization. So that's when I didn't talk about that in our themes A to Z. You're not allowed to have a miscellaneous section, ladies. So Melanie says, little girls and girly stuff become more appealing when all God bless you with his voice. I also have two sons. Yes, it's funny how when you don't get the girl stuff and you then it becomes so much more attractive to you. Um, Melanie says there's some problems with audio, so hopefully that'll be cured in the um, in the recording. Part of the audio problem varies by bandwidth for everybody's computer and whether or not I'm switching back and forth, I think, between again the internet view. So I'm sorry about that. It's all bandwidth related. Christine says, where can you find 12 by 12 plastic sleeves or zip blocks for storage? So we sell the super size single, and that's a 12 by 12 page. So, um, and to see what the different pages are for the scrap rack, you can just go, I think it's number two. I'm going to click here. See if we're on pages there. Yeah. So here are all the different pages that we've got for the scrap rack. And it's and um, just the super size single. So if you're looking for a bunch of super size single pages, they come in packs of 10, and they also come in a pack of 25, which I believe is at the bottom of this page, or a pack of 50. So if you're looking to store in the 12 by 12 pocket pages, that's a great option, that 50 page pack. Um, also, the scrap wrap pages, all of them are 12 and a half by 12 and a half. So even if you have paper that has a little tab across the top, it's still gonna fit in there with no problem. Every um, page is going to hold, um, we recommend 10 sheets of paper, but they'll hold 25. The same with the side loader single, which is that bottom picture um, with the cart, with the rainbow cardstock in it. It'll also hold lots of sheets of paper. Melba says, do you use the scrap rack to store memorabilia? Well, I do. <laughs> um, I actually use a holding album concept, which we won't get a lot of time to talk about in this challenge, but I do keep everything in scrap rack pages and sort of set up and ready to go by um, chronologically. So, uh, but it, so it does work really well for that as well. Um, we will talk about that in the January challenge, but it's not part of this class. Melanie says, recruit a friend is a great tool. A friend and I both hated doing dishes by hand, so we'd take turns calling each other and we'd talk while we did dishes. See, it works for everything. Get a friend on board and it just makes what is, what's the saying? Many hands make light work. So just when there's other people around, it just makes it easier to do that. Nikki says, so does that mean I need to empty my craft room and only organized stuff goes back into my room? If you can empty your craft room, that's the ideal way to do it. Everybody can't do that. <laughs> when I did my uh, craft room, that's exactly what I did. I took everything out into the hallway. I cleaned the whole room. I painted it. I put in some new shelves. Threw down an area rug because, you know, if it looks good and it's pretty, then we're more likely to leave it to keep it neat and organized. And everything was out in the hall. And I didn't bring anything back into the room that I wasn't putting away in the right place. And so that makes it really easy if you can do that. 
some people can't do that for whatever's going on in their life or they don't have the time or they can't stand the idea of having everything out in the hall for however long it's going to take to bring it back in. But it is definitely, there's actually an article on our website about that, about moving everything out and just bringing organized stuff back in. So um, that also helps inspire you to purge because then you get tired of sorting. It becomes easier and easier to get rid of questionable things. So if you can move everything out and only bring in organized stuff, that's ideal. And it also keeps you from moving stuff around constantly in the room as you're organizing. So if I, I say if you can, go for it. Um, Melanie says she puts her uh, scraps in her perch box. And then and that's exactly, so like any time I say throw something away, what I'm talking about, the recycle bin, the perch box, or kids' craft box, whatever. Um, but definitely, again, there are other people out there who are going to love what you don't want anymore. And so throw it in that perch box and somebody will be joyful for it. Sarah says, I think I am the minority. I only own paper stacks. I've never purchased a single sheet of paper. So you probably are in the minority, Sarah, but you probably have a lot of paper, too, in your paper stacks. And hopefully you're getting good use out of them. Uh, Fred says, do you group paper, cardstock, regular paper textures differently? Do you still sort primarily by color? No, I don't, I don't sort different paper textures differently. They all go by color. So try to avoid, again, if you take all of your vellum paper and keep all your vellum papers together, and you take all of your glitter papers and you keep all of your glitter papers together, then when you are looking in your blue section of paper to find blue paper, you're going to miss the vellum and you're going to miss the glitter, right? So that's one of the things we're sort of trained to do by conventional wisdom is separate things out from each other. But it's not what you want to do. You want to make things as visible and accessible and easy as you can so that you'll actually um, be able to use more of them as you go along. So really, really important um, to keep those. Now, you can take all of your blue vellum paper and put it in a super tight single pocket and put it in with the blue paper, right? Vellum's a little bit delicate. Glitter papers, the new ones are great. The old ones used to drop glitter everywhere. So you put that in a super size single pocket as well. Then if it drops glitter, it's not getting all over everything or glittering up other paper. But just get it in there with the right color or the right theme. Try not to separate it out or try not to think about different colors or textures or um, products or materials as different things. Try to keep them together so that you'll, with the things that you would use them with, so that you, could, you actually can use them. <coughs> OK. Um, Sue says, is there a way that we can print the mission checklist? Yes. So if you're on the website, um, I'm going to click back over to, and if you just go to um, organizationbootcamp.com, it's going to take you into this page. And then right down here, somewhere it says, um, first use the PDF to download your workbook. So you can download the workbook right here. It says download the bootcamp training manual. And if you click on that, it'll download the PDF. And you can, um, and you can print the, the PDF off all of it or just the, the checklist sheet that you want to use. And it actually looks more um, like a checklist on there than it looks like, like on my screen. Um, do you have any suggestions for organizing rubber stamps? I have both block mounted and unmounted rubber stamps. Yes, Ching. Uh, sorry, Erin. Yes, I do. Um, I do. We, <laughs> we'll talk about that in the third class. Also, I, I also want to let just let everybody know if you go to our website, right, on that Learn tab, you're going to find articles, pictures, videos for all kinds of these questions. And don't feel like you can't explore them. Don't feel like you have to wait we get to the third class to talk about um, photo storage or, I mean, to, uh, stamp storage or those kind of things. Jump in there, dig around, read the things that interest you or the things that you're most challenged by. Watch the videos. Email me if you have questions or bring up questions at the next class or, or the class that's appropriate for that subject, and I'm totally happy to help you. Also, on the website, at the very top on the left, you can see the pink block that says 2012 Back to School, Back to Scrapping, Get Organized Challenge. That is the eight-week challenge class we just concluded. All the videos are there. All the transcripts or the 
PDFs are there. The workbook is there. And so that breaks down into smaller classes. And so feel free to go in and watch those as well um, and get other questions answered and jump ahead. There's no, I mean, there's no, like, rules. I want this to really work for you, and I want you to have access to the information that you need. It's really going to help you get organized. So feel free to jump in there, watch those other videos, ask questions, email, get on the Facebook group. The gals on the Facebook group, a lot of them are alumni. They know all the answers, and they can be really helpful in that respect. So um, all that information is on our website, and you're welcome to, um, to kind of skip ahead and and learn whatever you need to learn and ask questions as you go. Um, Ching says, I love your ideas, thanks. You're so welcome. Uh, Andrina says, thanks for a lot of good tips. You're welcome, too. Leah says, I do several crafts and don't always use the same supplies. Should I store them together or separate? So, Leah, I would say store them together um, for the most part. So, like, if you are doing card making, rubber stamping, scrapbooking, altered art, frames, um, whatever, all, all these kind of things, right? Most art things have a color component. So the more color things you can get together in your four-section system, when you're working on a frame or a decoupage product, project, if you think, hey, I need something blue, I need a blue flower, or I'd like to put you know, something blue on here, you can go to that blue section and grab the flower or the bling or the paper or whatever it is. So definitely, the more stuff you can group together in that four-section system, the better off you're going to be. And the easier it's going to be for you to find what you need for those other projects as well. So I would definitely say if you can fit it into the four-section system, get it in there for all your different crafts. The other thing about that is if you separate things out, like I just bought this paper just for doing decoupage, so I'm going to keep it over here. Well, it might sit in that box for decoupage for years, right? But if it had been in your four-section system in that, you know, Father's Day section or the blue section or whatever, then you might have seen it for something else that it would have been perfect for it and you might have actually used that. So the more stuff you can group together, the more likely it is that you're actually going to use those things as well and get better use out of them. All right, moving right along. Um, Yar says, hi, Yar. Good to see your name pop up. Uh, she said, I just wanted to say, I, hi, I can listen live now. I'm home at this hour. Excited to continue with my organization work. I'm happy to have you on board, Yar. Um, Susan says, where do you get the 12 by 12 clear pages for the paper when sorting by theme? And I just um, popped that up, so I'm sure I've answered that since it popped up. And again, I'll send out a link to that um, page also because it is one that I talked about. So when you get the email from me tomorrow, there'll be a bunch of links in there about things we talked about, and it'll take you right there. You don't have to remember or rewatch or whatever. Louise says, just to strengthen or support people's resolve to get rid of any scrap less than six by six. I have been organizing gradually and used to keep any scrap bigger than one by six or two by three. With these sizes, I spent half my time auditioning one scrap, then the other, and sometimes still another only to find none were big enough. What a waste of time. 6x4 or 12x2 will work wonderfully. From now on, 6x4 is a great size for a journaling block, and 12x2 is long enough and wide enough to put a scrapbook page title on. All to say, all to stay, all this to say, thank you for strengthening my results to stop keeping all my tiny scraps that are never quite big enough and prevent me from seeing the one that is big enough. So absolutely, Louise, thanks for sharing that with us. It's true, right? You really want to find the stuff you need and not dig through the stuff that doesn't work. So she's saying 2 by 12, um, 4 by 6 um, as her minimum, and that's a boost up from what she was really using. So great job, Louise. And here's another important thing. She tried it on, right? She tried on saving scrap by a particular size, and she discovered that something different would work better. So just try it on like Louise did, and then you can decide, hey, this really works great, or hey, I need to keep something smaller, or I should keep something bigger. So thank you for sharing that. I'm excited. You can probably tell when I get excited. It's too bad you guys can't see me on the video because I'm kind of a spaz. My arms are always waving around or whatever. All right. Um, Linda says, I love the, this whole concept. Thank you for doing this. My question for you is are you going to organize our stamps? Yes, I am. So that's class number three in this series. 
Carla says, I don't know if I'm registered for the other classes. How can I check and see if I'm registered? If I'm not, where do I need to go to register the other classes for the boot camp? And this, if, you, if you got an email for this boot camp, then you're going to get an email for the next two boot camps. So just signing up once puts you on the list for the whole class series. So you don't need to worry about it, Carla, or anybody else who has that concern. Uh, Summit said, thank you. This is going to be great starting point, a great starting point for my overstuffed room. Well, we're so happy to have you, Summit, and everyone. Louise says, I'm one of those people who has two rooms full of stuff, and I want to work out of one room only. I've done at least four of your organization sessions, and I'm making pages, lots of pages these days, because I can find any piece of paper I want now in seconds. I still have a little work to do on stamps because I'm unmounting them all, and also on stickers because I had way too many of those, a ton of duplicates, unfortunately. But I do see the light at the end of the tunnel. A couple more sessions with you, and I'll be set to just maintain as I buy. Woo! Good job, Louise. And thanks for sharing that you've been through a couple of times. Um, Louise kind of sounds like a plant, doesn't she? Good job, Louise. Um, but it's true. Um, you know, most of us have so much stuff that just getting through it in three classes or even eight classes is um, somewhat unrealistic. For some people, it's told that they can do it. But for most of us, we have all these other things going on in our lives, and people interrupt our scrapbooking and our organizing time for things like being a mother or a worker or whatever. So once you do the boot camp, feel free to join us in January and just keep moving through. And you can always drop in on classes if you need something particular, like just stamps or just a refresher on embellishments or whatever. All those classes are out there. And the whole reason I do this is so that you'll love crafting again, right? That's what I want. I want you to not be overwhelmed. I want you to love crafting. And I want you to get your friends into crafting, and I want you to go to scrapbooking and paper crafting events, and I want you to love it and not be overwhelmed with your stuff. That's my whole goal. All right. Um, uh, Carla says, never mind the second question. I just found the answer. This is a great boot camp. I'm excited to start. Well, we're happy to have you. And Dreamus says, I have original scrap box now. I know how to organize again. Good. Good, good, good. It's so exciting for me when everybody starts getting excited about getting organized. Uh, Brenda says, thanks, this has been really good. I think I might have skipped that back and forth here. Sarah says, weren't you giving a, um, weren't you giving away a big boot camp survival kit in that? Oh, yes. Um, yes, I thought you were talking about the price for tonight. Um, I don't remember my, the gal's name off the top of my head. They got the big boot camp survival kit. Karen sent it out last week. Um, so I'll have to check. I will. I'm going to write a little note. I'll include it in the email that goes out um, tomorrow who the winner is. So you guys can all know who the winner was. Um, Leah says, can you give an example print? Can you give an example print paper when sorting? Um, so prints would be um, something like some geometric design or um, something that wasn't per like a flower or a dot, but it was just like a squirrely design or a sewing pattern or something like that. So, you know, maybe it's zigzags or it's not a floral or a dot or a distress. It's just some other kind of design. Brenda says, I run the scrap through my paper shredder to use for gift packages. Oh, that's a great idea. You can make your own gift confetti um, to put in your gift bag with your scraps. I bet that's adorable. Great idea. Barbara says, amen to the sample pages we do at Crop. Three years ago, I created six two-page layouts with small colors. My next project will be my New England Colors Tour, and all those completed pages were right there in my fall color papers. Yay! Good job, Barbara. They will go directly into my book, and all I need to do is add the pictures. Excellent. Christine says, I've had great success in trading with others at crops or retreats, but if not, someone could always use your items you no longer need. So that's a good point, too. So um, we talked about earlier that your what you scrap like about changes, right? So your supplies change and your categories change. So if you've outgrown scrapbooking about baby, but now you have a son who's playing soccer, you might take all your baby stuff with you to a crop and swap it with somebody who needs baby but has extra soccer or whatever. So that's a great suggestion. Um, Debbie says, free recycle groups through Yahoo groups for giving away purchased items to. I've given to new scrap workers this way. So, yeah, lots of great suggestions there. Free cycle is great. 
Barb says, how do you decide which themes, beach versus vacation, Halloween and fall versus holidays? So um, Halloween and fall are going to be in the calendar year, so just where they where they fall. So you may have your calendar year by month, in which case fall might start in September. Um, depends monthly, I guess. Technically, summer ends the 22nd or the 21st of September, so there's very little fall there. I think of fall as September because that's when the kids go back to school. So, um, so fall is going to be September, October. Halloween is going to be in October. Thanksgiving is going to be in November. So there you have your whole fall holiday section together, if that makes sense. And then as far as themes, beach versus vacation. Beach versus vacation depends mainly on how you think about that. So if you think about um, beach as beach, then you want to put it in beach. But if the only time you ever go to the beach is when you're on vacation, then you're probably going to put it under vacation. So it's important is whatever, wherever your brain goes, um, that's where your supplies go so that you can follow your brain to find your supplies. That makes sense. Um, Andrina says, I started purge as you talked today. I have a few places to send it. Good job. And you know, it's funny, or the, especially the eight-week classes, um, there's a lot of gals who work on the challenge while I'm actually talking. So um, you've already dedicated that hour of listening. So some people like to watch their screen. I know that. But other people listen, and then they do the task while they're listening um, because they've dedicated that time. So that's one of the nice things about coming to class live is that you've committed to being here for that time, so you almost feel like um, you get that sort of that extra thing to work while you're listening. So good job, Andrina. Way to start. Darcy says, I purge and make kits of paper, letters, and then donate to friends who hold the pink crop every year. She uses the kits as giveaways to attendees. So another great suggestion. Hi, it's Lavie. I sold the many containers I now don't need because of having this scrap rack at a crop and was able to pay for half my hotel room for the night. Yay! Score, she says. And I didn't even look at what the vendors were selling. I was satisfied. Usually I would have to buy something, and I was more than productive bringing just the sections of the scrap rack I needed in my travel pack. Thanks so much. Great job, Lizzie. I'm so happy to hear that. That is the amazing thing about using the four section system, ladies. I mean, um, shopping is great, and it's fun, and it's one of the reasons we love to scrap us. But when you really want to get something done, it really lets you focus in on just that one thing. And it keeps you from getting overwhelmed. So if, you, if you're going to work on your sports pages at the crop and all you take is your sports stuff, then you don't get distracted by your Christmas stuff or by your Halloween stuff or whatever. You're really able to focus in on what you need. So good job. Yay. All right. Connie says, I purchased this Heidi Swap chipboard file folders in different sizes, cheese and scrapbooks. How and where do I store these? Most are chipboard to be decorated, and some are already printed on. So. I would put them in my rainbow section um, under, like, if they're just plain chipboard, just in that plain chipboard. I mean, you know, put, put them all together in that brown section or whatever, unless, of course, you bought them with intention. So if you bought them knowing you were going to use them on your vacation pages, then you want to put them in your vacation section, or knowing you were going to use them with your kids' school pages, then they're going to go in the school section. So if you bought them with intent, which is hopefully how you're going to purchase everything from now on, then put them wherever you intended to use them. And if you just bought them because you like them, then put them by color. And you can have a neutral section. Um, and you can put your just plain chipboard right in that neutral section as well. Now, some people are going to look at file folders, and they're going to think school, or they're going to think office, or they're going to think work also. So again, however you thought about those, that's where you want to store them so that you'll find them. Um, Valerie says, I have your pages, so how do I label the bags, say, January for the calendar section? So I would just use a self-adhesive tab. So let me click here into the accessory section, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So we carry the Office Depot brand, but they're just these little self-adhesive tabs. And you can stick them not only onto a chipboard, but you can actually stick them onto your um, super size single pages, and then you can just put the little tab in there. So I'm assuming that's what you're talking about when you say you have our pages. You sit, stick the little tab in there and label it with whatever it is, and it'll stick off the side. Very handy. Christine says, I have some of my pattern paper organized by polka dot stripes, et cetera, and that helps also. Yes, I agree. Putting things by dots and stripes. Um, 
especially if you tend to um, create that way, that you want a dotted background or a striped background. Um, and again, I would do mine by within the color section and then also that possibly that multi-section if it, there was no color that jumped out at me. Joanne says, do office supply stores carry the 12 by 12 size boxes that you recommended for paper storage or just scrapbook stores? Unfortunately, it's just scrapbook stores. The ones at the office supply stores are um, all 8.5 by 11 or magazine size. So this is the paper storage box dividers, kind of here with the purpley background on the right side of my screen. And the paper storage boxes are where now? Let's see if I can find them. Oh, right here. Vertical paper storage box. I'll click on that because that's a little bit easier. So this is a plastic one from Cropper Hopper. And you can either put it straight up and down or you can lay it on its back. And then there's the dividers that go with that as well. Um, but the other, but like Joanne and Michaels, I think they carry the bigger and the 12 by 12 boxes. Uh, Maria says, I'm sorry I have to leave. I will check out the rest of the Q&A on YouTube later. Thanks, Tiffany. I'm looking forward to getting myself organized. Lorianne says, 13 by 13 zips are available at the dollar store. So if you're looking for big Ziploc bags, you can get them at the dollar store. Um, Lo Lo Lois says, I must go. So thank you for the time you have spent with us and have enjoyed. We'll tune in next Tuesday. Have a wonderful evening. Maggie says, I'm a Stampin' Up! demo and have lots of double-sided papers which are bought in sets. What would be the best way to store these? So remember, we want to keep things together we would use together. So take all those double-sided papers that go together within that theme or within that color group, put them all into a super-sized single pocket and keep things together that you would use together, especially while there are lots of the, you know, where you have that whole group of them. So this is true with things like basic gray paper, too. So and as an example, Let's use basic gray um, life of the party paper, right? That's a birthday party theme. But I don't want to take all 18 sheets of paper and divide them up by color. I want to keep them all together because they fit that theme. And they go with the stickers and they go with the um, alphabet stickers that, you know, and the 12 by 12 sheet of stickers that all came together in that packet. So I'm going to take the front piece of paper that shows all the things that are in that basic gray kit for life of the party and I'm going to put the basic gray life of the party in my basic gray paper storage box with all the other basic gray kits that I have. And I'm just going to take the life of the party thing and put it in the birthday section. And then when I'm working on birthday, I'm going to say, hey, life of the party would be perfect. And I'll go to the basic gray kit and I'll pull it out and I'll use it. And when there's only a few sheets of paper left, then I'll move those over into the birthday section. But will I have lots of things that go together very much like I did with the kit box from Club Scrap? I'm going to keep it all together. When it comes down to just a few things, then I'm going to um, then I'm going to divide it out and put it away. So if that makes sense. Okay. Lisa said, "Oh, Melanie, I'm skipping one here." Ching says, "Which one is the eight-week challenge? The back to school or overwhelmed summer? Back to school is the one we just finished, so that's the most recent one, and then we'll start another one in January called the Results Get Organized." Melanie says, "Also, the scraps are useful for punching samples um, when you do punch and." and stamp catalog. So good point, Melanie. If you keep a pile of scraps handy, we're going to talk about organizing your stamps and punches. And so you might be able to use up some of those scraps for that. And that is lesson three, which I believe is on the 20th of the month. So good point. I forgot about that. Lisa says, how do you unmount wood stamps without damaging them? Um, that question comes up a lot. There's a couple of different ways to do it. Some people use a hair dryer. Some people put them in the microwave. And some people use undo. So if you want to get more specific information, post that question up on the Facebook page, and you'll get a lot of feedback from people who've done um, what you're trying to do. And you'll, they'll be able to answer more specific questions about exact products that you're using. But there's a lot of ways to do it. And it is a good thing to do, because you can really condense down your rubber stamps and get more use out of them without them taking up so much space once you unmount them. Um, Serena says, sorry, I joined late. Can I review something about tonight? Yes, we're recording the whole session, Serena. So it usually takes a little while to upload it, and then I'm going to post it on the um, boot camp organization page. And so you'll get an email tomorrow with a link to it, so you can watch the whole thing at your convenience. Um, Diane Young says she's going to be at the Maiden Dollar Center for the Seattle Scrapbook Show this weekend. So I will see you there, Diane. Um, 
Serena says, I can only see the photo of the flyer. Is there something else to see? Um, yes, that's just because I've been flipping back and forth. So when you see the recorded version, you'll see all the different slides. Melanie says, the rainbow and four season sections also work when organizing quilting fabrics. Um, just don't throw them into the paper. So Melanie brings up a good point. Um, I guess we talked a little bit about other craft supplies um, just a little while ago. But once you start to think um, in that four section system, you'll see how it works for all kinds of different things in your life and how it can be tweaked around um, and how things can be made simpler. I'll give you a, kind of an easy example of keeping things together you would use together, right? I talked about the silverware drawer. And I want you to think about your linen closet. So some people in their linen closet have their flat sheets and then their fitted sheets and then their pillowcases in three different piles, right? So when they need to make the bed, they grab a flat sheet, they grab a fitted sheet, and they grab the pillowcases. So it's three things they have to pull together. Some people fold their pillowcases and their fitted sheet inside their flat sheet so they have a whole set of sheets and then they put that in the linen closet. Some people open up a pillowcase and put the flat sheet and the fitted sheet and the pillowcase in the pillow in a pillowcase, and then they put the pillowcase in the linen closet. But do you ever make your bed in the linen closet? I'm guessing not. So what you've done is you've laundered your linens, right? And you folded them up, and then you moved them somewhere else in the house where they're not going to be used, so that when you need them, you have to go there and get them, and then you have to bring them somewhere else to actually use them. Right? That's how we were trained to do it. We were trained to put our sheets in the linen closet. That's what the linen closet is for. But you use your sheets in the bedroom. So take your sheet set, fold it all together so it all stays in a nice little bundle, and put it in the bottom drawer of your dresser. So when you're ready to change the linens in your bedroom, you pull the dirty linens off, and you go to the dresser drawer, and you put the new linens on, and you wash the sheets, and you put them back in your dresser drawer. And you've just eliminated that one sort of worthless step of putting things in the linen closet and going there for them instead of having what you need next to you when you need it. So you've eliminated that whole step. And so excitingly for me, people tell me all these stories about how they've applied like this keeping things together I would use together concept and combine and conquer to weird things in their life. And I love it. So if you apply a concept somewhere else, please share it with me and share it with Facebook because I love it. All right, sorry, I got a little sidetracked there. Terry says, this is my second time listening, and you have helped me really get started. Just in time, I am in the process of redoing my scrap area. I have taken before picks and can't wait to show the after. Yay! I hope you'll put the before picks up on the Facebook page, Terry. Linda says, I really have a lot of stuff. Really, I have purged a lot and still have a lot of stuff. I have two of the scrap racks full. My question is that about embellishments, brass, eyelets, metal pieces. I have five plastic containers filled with them and did not put them in the system because I have so many but forget to use them. Same thing with my boxes of ribbon. Any suggestions for a scrapbooker collector who really wants to be a true scrapbooker? I would just start migrating stuff out of your, um, out of those boxes and into your scrap right window. You already know if you're using it that if this stuff is visible, and accessible and you see it that that's the stuff that you use so you probably already know in your brain that you need to get it out of those boxes and put it with all the stuff that you're using so here's kind of another little trick about organizing so you're probably thinking um, I would have to buy two more scrap racks to put all that stuff in there and um, since by you purchasing scrap racks that's how I earn my living I hope you do However, in a more realistic world, you can achieve getting all that stuff out of those things by not buying any more scrap racks. Darn it. Um, by just limiting the amount of space that you allow yourself to, to store scrapbooking supplies, in this case, two scrap racks. So I'm going to give you kind of an easy example that will make this maybe a little bit clearer. In my closet, I have a set number of hangers, right? If I buy something new, I can't add another hanger. That's my rule. Okay. If I kept adding hangers, I would have this closet jam-packed with things that I couldn't actually see anything, and I wouldn't be wearing things because it would be so hard to find things that I would be doing what my teenage friends do and always wear the thing that's on the very top of the pile on the washing machine or the dryer or whatever. Right? That's how they operate. I don't want to do that. I want to see all my things and wear all the things that I love. So I have a set number of hangers. You can do the same thing with your scrap rack. You can say, this is how much space I have. 
I'm going to migrate stuff into my scrap rack, which means I have to migrate other things out. Ugh, more purging. But you already know what you see and what you can get to is what you use. So just kind of keep that in mind. The more stuff I make visible and accessible, the more of a scrapbooker I am and the less of a collector that I am. And that will really help. The cat and dog have both invaded my space, as has Max, my 14-year-old son. All right, Leslie says, I use smaller scraps to punch out heart star circles and other shapes and then run them through my darons to make my own stickers. So an excellent way to use those kind of things, and you can store them. You can store your hearts in Valentine's Day. You can store all those other punched out things by color, and then they're visible and they're accessible, and then you can use them. And especially if you have kids that are school age um, and they're doing school projects or whatever, and they're going to find those hearts and stars and flowers or whatever in your little supply collection and they're actually going to use them. It's going to be a win for everybody. So, um, let's see. I go to, uh, Carmen says, I go to monthly crops and have reduced four totes to two of them. Have been watching your videos for over two months. Soon we'll be, soon we'll purchase a scrap rack. Now that we don't have to move anymore, then I can work on my studio. We are a military family. So, um, excellent. So good job, Carmen. All right. Debbie says, the easiest way to purge is to move inside a motorhome because then you have limited space. I've lived in one for seven years but um, been scrapbooking for 20. So, yes. Uh, you know what, Debbie? My goal is to live in a motorhome when I retire, too. So I'm going to have to pare it down even for me. But there, that is a good way when you're limited. It's kind of like being limited in your closet, right? You only have so much space, so you have to get rid of stuff that you're not using. Um, Melanie says, Post-it also makes file tabs that can be repositioned. Excellent um, reminder, Melanie, and those are great. So if you haven't seen the new Post-it tabs, um, they are so cool. Okay, Melanie, uh, Melba says, thank you so much. It's 11 in Michigan, so I have to go to bed. Oh, my God, I've learned so much. Thank you so much for all your ideas, help, but mostly for the scrap rack, and you're so welcome. I know it's getting late on the East Coast. Serena says, awesome, thank you, so she can watch the video later. Um, and then other people just popping in and out saying good night. And um, Melanie says, she says go in the shelf in our bedroom closet, along with blankets, towels go under the sinks in each bathroom. So it's perfect. That's exactly it. Melanie's an organization master. I might have to recruit her to come work for me. All right, ladies. Thank you so much for joining me. I know it's late. I know we all want to see what's happening with the election returns. So I totally appreciate you joining me on election night. I'm going to um, get this recording posted. Hopefully it will post up over tonight. And then anybody who wants to watch it can watch it on the Boot Camp page. And I'll get an email out to all of you tomorrow with all the details from uh, tonight's class and all the links and stuff. So thanks so much for joining me. And I look forward to talking with you again next week. Have a